this trip we're going to be visiting the Hindenburg Line which was Germany's strongest defensive line on the Western Front. Um, on the map it's marked in red. Um, you can see Calais up in the left hand, up in the left hand corner of France and um, I think you can make out Peron which was um, near the old Somme battlefield. Um, the two blue lines, the one on the left is the Canal du Nord and the one on the right is the Saint Quentin Canal. The Hindenburg line was Germany's strongest defensive line on the Western Front. After their failed attempt to, to beat the Allies in early 1918, they retreated to it and its northern extension, which was called the um, drocourt caen line, which you can also see marked in the map in dotted red. This trip I'll be looking at the capture of the drocourt caen line, starting on the 2nd of September 1918, the breaking of this line, and the attack on the Canal du Nord, on the 27th of September 1918 and the attack on the main Hindenburg line north of St Quentin on the 27th to the 29th of September and finally the capture of the Beaurevoir line which was a kind of reserve line just behind the Hindenburg line a few days into October. Um, a good book about this is 100 days on Amazon Kindle. It's 100 days by Nick Lloyd, which puts the battle into perspective. This feature here, this wood was called the Crow's Nest and it was occupied by about 300 men and it had to be captured um, before the approach to the um, Drocourt Count line. Um, and it was um, heavily shelled and um, then occupied by infantry. It's the view of the battlefield um, in front of the um, Drocourt Cairn line looking backwards. Um, over there is the feature we saw earlier called the Crow's Nest and um, coming round um, I can see um, but it's um, pretty high up here and the advance up here is going to be um, pretty difficult. We're pretty much on the um, Drocourt Cairn line now and it consisted of a number of um, trench lines and um, this is one of the um, middle ones and also a lot of um, barbed wire and um, a, um, a, a few um, concrete emplacements. But this is looking forward from the um, DQ line towards the um, German positions. Um, over there Um, having um, crossed the um, DQ line, um, we come to the um, village of um, Cagnicourt, there in the distance, and the um, Canal du Nord is just the other side of that. Um, after the D DQ line um, was captured on the um, 2nd of September, the um, Germans retreated to the um, Canal du Nord. Over there is Cagnicourt and um, during the attack on the DQ line um, about 600 heavy guns were used of about 6,000 guns on the um, whole of the Western Front and these guns were moved by um, uh, tractors 
um, mainly um, American and the gunners were continually in operation either firing their guns or um, moving them forward and um, this enabled the um, continuation of the slowish war of movement where they moved about um, three miles a day and also um, some tanks were involved in this but um, this was um, not um, ideal conditions for tanks um, and um, they were still um, at this stage of the war pretty slow. Also by this stage of the war the um, the RAF had pretty much command of the skies and they devised an ingenious um, scheme for um, directing the gunners from um, from the air. Here is a sunken lane on the um, road from the Drocourt Caen switch line to the village of Cagnicourt. Um, the Germans would have come along here during their retreat, um, which was, I believe, actually conducted in quite good weather, rather like it is now. This is the village of Cagnicourt. It's just about a mile south of the um, Arras to um, Cambrai Road. Quite a pretty little village. Over there is the village that we were at earlier and um, the Germans retreated um, to the um, east back as far as the Canal du Nord which was their next defensive position and is over there um, just behind those trees there in that direction. The Germans um, didn't advance, didn't retreat back to the um, Canal du Nord straight away but um, they held um, some intermediate positions like um, Merver um, on their way back to the um, Canal du Nord. Canal du Nord just over all the other, over the other side of all these guys here. Canal du Nord the German main defensive position. They had um, some defences on each side but um, most of their defences were on the far side. This is the Canal du Nord going in a northerly direction. Um, it's quite wide here and um, was difficult to bridge in the sections even where it was dry and in some cases they drove tanks into the center and put a bridge across to the abandoned tank top and another bridge the other side and um, crossed it by this means. On the other side was the main German line used a very sophisticated method to cross it much the same as the um, modern day army would use. Um, the troops were divided into riflemen, um, Lewis gunners, um, grenade carrying bombardiers, and they also carried ladders to get down the near bank, which was about 10 feet high, um, but um, they could scramble up the far bank which was about four feet high and um, the dry section stretched from that lock you can just about make out in the distance down there to the lock that we were at previously. Here's a view of the Canal du Nord looking south. This was all dry at the time and they got the tanks across by dumping an old one in the middle and building a bridge from the top of it to each bank. There is Boulogne Ward on the far horizon. The, the attackers, including tanks, had to cross up there and right across 
from the canal du Nord, which is um, down there in that direction by those trees. And the tanks had to face 77 millimeter guns firing over oak. The wood at the top of the hill that we could see is actually called quarry wood. Um, and there in the middle is um, the cemetery. And on the far horizon, I oh know, sorry, behind it now is Boulogne wood. This is the second day of our trip and uh, we're not following the Canadians from yesterday. They went off towards Cambrai. We're following a preliminary attack on a position outside the um, Hindenburg line known as Mont Saint Quentin. This was carried out by um, um, two Australian division uh, battalions. Um, they had been fighting ever since August and they were rather reduced in numbers to about two or three hundred per battalion and um, they were also rather exhausted but they were also pretty battle hardened and um, these Australians were commanded by um, Monash and we'll be hearing more about the the advance on um, Mont Saint Quentin. We just mentioned that um, the actual Hindenburg line is about a mile the other side of that Mont Saint Quentin, and um, Haig um, originally thought this was just going to be a um, diversionary operation, but um, Monash had other ideas. Um, this action took place around the um, 31st of August 1918, which is um, um, a lot earlier than the attack on the Hindenburg Line, and it was kind of a preliminary operation. Um, the Australians managed to get into Mont Saint Quentin, but they were driven out again, and. Um, held a line at the top of this ridge here, just short of Mont Saint Quentin, um, which became the jumping off line for um, later attacks. Um, they lost a um, considerable number of um, men in, um, in doing this because the um, German Guards Division was stationed at uh, Mont Saint Quentin. This is looking back from the German position at Mont Saint Quentin, um, and um, over there is runs the Canal du Nord, where we were yesterday. Um, this was um, on the 1st of September 2000, uh, 1918 that uh, Mont Saint Quentin was captured and um, Haig was well aware that um, his troops were very exhausted and he called up the American um, commander um, General Pershing who agreed to um, release two American divisions to assist with the um, efforts of the um, British and um, French and um, Commonwealth um, allies. Here's a view of the um, from a view from the village of Mont Saint Quentin of the um, battlefield up which the um, five or six hundred or so Australians um, attacked. To keep this in attack in perspective, one has to remember that um, Haig, um, commander of the um, British troops, um, under the overall commander General Foch, was in 
command of um, over a, a million men on the um, whole of the um, front. So this is a, a, a fairly um, small sector, but it was an important jumping off point for the attack on the Hindenburg line later. Here's a view of um, a um, trench um, in the wood between the um, ground we've just come over and the um, village of Mont Saint Quentin, which was held for a short time on the 1st of um, September. Here we're on the um, third line of the Hindenburg line. Um, the second line was down there in the valley and the um, first line was um, the other side of the valley. Um, we're looking west here. The um, Somme battlefield is about 25 miles in that direction. The Hindenburg line was 90 miles long and um, it had an extension of another um, 50 miles to the north. Each sector in the Hindenburg line had um, concrete pillboxes separated by about 1,000 meters and um, machine gun fire. Um, the Maxim guns had a range of about 1800 meters so they could cover the um, distance in between the um, concrete pillboxes and also um, barbed wire um, funneled any attackers into zones where they could be hit by the um, machine gunners. So a pretty formidable obstacle. Um, the reason why it wasn't quite so such an obstacle was that um, the reserves could not be brought up in time to defend it when it was attacked. Well, doing things in rather the reverse here, this is about as far as they got on the um, 29th of September. The 46th Midland Division broke through the Hindenburg line and reached this third line here um, up the top of this slope which represents um, the um, capture of the complete three lines of the um, Hindenburg line. We're here on the um, British side of the Hindenburg line. That's the um, um, St. Quentin Canal down in the dip there. And in the far distance is the village of um, Bellanglees. And on the other side of that is the memorial that we were at previously. Um, the Hindenburg line itself is um, a brown line of earth just beyond the edge of the green here. I don't know if it's possible in this video to see it, but um, that, that is the first line of the Hindenburg line. The second line is the line at the canal, and the third line is the line that we were at earlier. Um, this was attacked along a front of um, 200 yards, uh, sorry, 2,000 yards by the 46th Midland Division. The front of attack started at a bridge, um, just about, um, to, well it wasn't a bridge, it had been blown up, it was a blown up remains of a bridge, um, just about uh, straight ahead there, along, along the canal, um, and for 2,000 yards up in this direction, um, along the banks of the um, 
canal to where they came to a bridge called the um, Rikval Bridge. The guns played a big part in the capture of the um, Hindenburg Line by the 46th Midland Division. Um, they had um, 88 machine guns attached to the division with which they were able to um, lay down pretty much a barrage enabling them to um, get down to the um, canal um, before the enemy could bring up any reserves and when they got to the canal um, they um, they crossed it in three separate um, groups. The group on the right um, crossed it with the aid of life jackets from channel ferries and little boats. Um, the group in the middle here crossed it on um, where it was nearly dry on um, matting and the group on the far left crossed it over the um, Rikaval Bridge. And after that um, a heavy barrage was laid down on the far side of the um, canal um, to stop the um, Germans reoccupying the position and um, the 46th Midland Division were able to um, carry on um, almost right up to the um, far side almost up to the horizon line there all in one day so that is how they broke through the Hindenburg line on the 29th of September 1918. This is from the um, famous Rikaval Bridge. Um, this was um, the crossing of the St. Quentin Canal on the northern sector of the 2,000-yard um, front on, on which they attacked. And um, a creeping barrage came from up where we were before, um, very closely followed by um, men of the 46th um, North Midland Division. Um, so that they could get to the bridge before the Germans had time to um, blow it, um, which they did, although a few shells um, actually um, landed on the bridge um, before they, they got this far and it was slightly damaged, but they managed to repair it by um, three o'clock that afternoon sufficiently for vehicles to cross. And just going round to the other side here, this is the um, direction towards um, Be Bellinglees and St. Quentin of the St. Quentin Canal. But the, the capture of this was a very important part in the taking of the Hindenburg Line since it allowed all these guys to cross without having to get, scramble across the river. Today we're going to um, cover the attack um, north of the sector that we were at yesterday on the Hindenburg Line. Um, the St. Quentin Canal went into a tunnel called the Bellicourt Tunnel, um, six miles long. And um, the Hindenburg Line was um, above this and um, was um, fortified in depth um, as we saw um, in the um, previous attack and it was attacked in a combined operation probably one of the first of its sort um, between Americans and um, Australians under the um, Australian commander Monash Originally this sector was to be attacked by the Australians alone but um, Monash um, succeeded in getting um, 
two divisions of Americans who had been assigned to the um, British Army on the 1st of September by the American commander Pershing on condition that they fought as an American unit. Um, so one of the um, difficulties here was that um, we had two armies with different cultures, the Australians and the Americans, um, fighting the um, same battle. A third difficulty was that the, um, the British Army had um, not managed to capture the, orig the originally planned jumping off points for this operation to capture the Hindenburg Line over the Bellicourt Tunnel. So um, there were three um, potential difficulties there and um, anyhow it resulted in the um, tunnel not being captured on the first day um, and not actually captured until two days later. Well this is roughly the um, start zone. The idea was that the um, Americans um, should go through first um, and um, be followed by the, by the Australians who would um, go through them after they'd um, captured the, um, the first um, um, area of um, land. The um, problem arose that the um, Americans um, did not mop up um, residual Germans um, as they went along and consequently um, the Australians who followed through um, got this job as well um, which didn't make them very happy and also um, the barrage um, could not be fired um, immediately in front of the advancing troops in case it hit anyone who was still in the area that was being mopped up. Um, this started a blame game which is still discussed in um, staff colleges to this day, I am told. This is the northern part of the battlefield. The, the start was from the left and coming across there to that um, clump of trees on the horizon a round clump of trees was called the Knoll and the Americans with their Australian mentors in place of officers were given just 36 minutes to get as far as there. Um, some of them did but um, it was a tragic day for the Americans they lost more than half who, of those who set out never survived the first day um, they had a, um, a, a barrage um, in front of them um, which they had to um, follow um, close behind but the um, machine gunners of, of the Germans um, caught quite a lot of them on the wire and uh, of those Americans who reached the, um, the knoll most of them were, were also killed by machine guns After the um, American attack on the um, Knoll failed to reach it in um, 36 minutes, um, the Australian troops um, started to um, come through and um, they were held up by um, isolated groups of um, German soldiers and by machine gunners who had not been mopped up by the Americans but um, there wasn't much time to do any mopping up. The, the um, Americans um, were um, very inexperienced and were taking orders from their um, Australian mentors right up to the um, start of the battle and um, at the end of the day they had to retreat back from um, Guillemont Farm again. This is from Guillemont Farm, looking south. Um, the far line of trees there, in the extreme distance, is on the top of the Bellicourt Tunnel, which was um, the objective um, for the um, first day. Curiosity about Guillemont Farm is that um, 
um, Ian Fleming's father, um, Ian Fleming being the guy who wrote the James Bond novels, um, Ian Fleming's father was killed at um, Guillemont Farm, although not during this particular battle. The two American divisions um, involved in the attack on the Bellicourt Tunnel were the 27th, um, mainly from the um, north and from the New York area, um, and uh, the 30th, who were from um, the, um, the south. And um, the fact that they were one from the north and one from the south was one of the reasons why Monash decided to um, put them under the command of Australian officers and um, let the American officers um, just have a um, bit of a rest period. This is the American cemetery at Boney. It, it um, contains um, the um, what, the burials of um, Americans who were killed in the um, First War um, from um, a, a number of um, different areas of the um, battlefield, um, including a lot who were um, killed on the um, Hindenburg Line. This is the village of Boney. It more or less marked the border between the um, attacks of the um, 27th Division to the north and the 30th American Division to the south. We, we didn't see the sector of the battlefield that was attacked by the um, 30th American Division. Um, but um, I gather that they were rather more successful um, than um, those who attacked in the 27th and that the um, 30th Division managed to um, get a breach in the um, Hindenburg line but not um, capture it. This is a view of the area to the north of the covered over Bellingcore Tunnel. Um, this would have been attacked by the um, 30th American Division. We didn't have time to um, follow their attack this morning, but um, I understand that um, they did manage to um, cause a breach in the um, Hindenburg Line. Um, to the north of them was the um, attack by the American 27th Division and to the south was the breach in the line I'm sorry, the capture of the line by the 46th North Midland Division. So that concludes our visit to the Hindenburg